In this video, I'm going to tell you how, in the process of becoming low carbon, the UK electrical grid kind of broke, and how some people managed to get around that. Oh, and of course, how you can join them. And it's sponsored by Ground News. More on them later. The UK used to get its electricity from the most polluting source of power of all. Coal. In fact, we think of China today as being dependent on coal, but for much of the 20th century, the average Briton emitted around 10 tonnes of carbon dioxide every year from burning coal, more than double what the average person in China does today. But that's all changed. Over the past few decades, the fraction of British electricity generated through burning coal has massively declined, and last month, the UK shut down its final coal-fired power station for good. As a result, the amount of CO2 emitted to produce the average kilowatt hour of electrical energy used in the UK, the carbon intensity, has nosedived. This data shows the average carbon intensity per week of the year in 2009, and look at how it has changed since then. If we take an average across the year, then you can see the carbon intensity has decreased by more than 70% from its peak. This is such good news. Now, when I posted this on TikTok and Instagram, follow me on either, depending on whether you like your surveillance to be Chinese or American, a lot of people argued that this result was nonsense because the UK now just imports more electricity and that electricity is created by burning coal. Firstly, yes, the UK imports about 10% of its electricity, and that percentage has slightly increased over the past 10 years. And secondly, this carbon intensity data that I showed includes imported electricity. Yes, some of that imported electricity comes from burning coal, though not much, it's mostly Dutch imports, but UK generation is indeed coal-free, and UK carbon intensity, on average, has dropped by more than 70%, even when you include imported electricity. If you want to see all this stuff in real time, by the way, including imports and exports and carbon intensity data, then check out this website, link down in the description, along with all the other references. Today, instead of coming from coal, much of the UK's electricity, almost 40% over the past 12 months, now comes from renewables, especially wind. And because renewables are the cheapest way to generate electricity, and certainly cheaper than coal, this must mean that the UK's electricity prices have massively decreased as well. Right? No, us Brits pay some of the highest electricity prices in the world for each kilowatt hour of electricity we use, despite an increasing fraction of our electricity coming from cheap sources. To explain why, I'm gonna need a drink. Imagine that you're in a bar and you want to order a mojito that's this tall. Okay, well, you might expect to pay a proportional amount for each ingredient used. So you know how much it costs per 100ml of rum, and of soda water, and lime juice, and the cost per mint leaf and per teaspoon of sugar. We'll assume that the ice is free. So let's say that you use 75ml of rum. That'll cost about £1.27. 50ml of lime juice. 22p. Add your sugar and some mint leaves and then top it up with soda water. So purely based on the cost of ingredients, you can expect this drink to cost £1.70. Cocktail places are fleecing us. If instead of a cocktail, though, you were buying electricity, you would expect it to work basically the same. If the UK was getting 30% of its electricity at a given moment from gas, 40% from renewables, 20% from nuclear and biomass, and the rest from imports, then the average cost per kilowatt hour should be proportional to the contribution of each source to the grid. But it doesn't work like that. Instead, the wholesale price of British electricity is calculated like this. Right, so you want a drink that's this tall. That's your demand for electricity. Okay, well, let's first of all make use of the free ice at this place. You bung in your lime juice, your sugar, your mint. These are all the different ways of generating electricity, some more expensive than others. Top it up with soda water. Oh, and of course, the rum, the most expensive ingredient. Now, this is, let's say, 275 millilitres of drink and you are charged the price per milliliter of rum, the most expensive ingredient, multiplied by the total volume of the drink. So this costs £4.68. Regardless of whether there is 75 ml of rum in there, or if there's just a single drop. 
This is called marginal pricing, and it's how the wholesale price of electricity in Britain is calculated. Energy suppliers buy electricity from producers in order to make up demand, starting naturally with the cheapest forms of power generation, solar and wind, then moving on to nuclear and lastly expensive fossil fuels like gas. But the price of gas, the most expensive fuel, is what sets the price of the entire grid, regardless of what fraction it contributes. So for example, both of these grids have the same wholesale price of electricity despite one having way more renewables. And after buying all the other cheap sources of electricity, UK energy suppliers use gas to top up the last part of our supply in gas peaking plants more than basically anywhere else. In 2021, an analysis found that gas set the price of British electricity 98% of the time. And over the past 12 years, you can see how the price of gas, which has been highly volatile, has massively influenced the price of British electricity. So why do we have this system? Well, it was designed for a grid where you knew what demand would be and so could turn on the necessary reliable power plants well in advance. And it did that in a transparent and cheap way. And for the longest time, it did that very well. But it didn't account for intermittent generation from renewables, which by their nature don't produce a constant output. And so a grid using them needs to be balanced more often. And doing that with gas, as the UK does more than anywhere else, requires more gas peaking plants, which are expensive to run per unit of electricity produced. So to summarize, we have the most expensive electricity because of how our electricity price is calculated, marginal pricing, combined with our exposure to the price of gas. And we use gas to top up the last part of our grid so much because we now have so many more renewables in our electricity mix. And we have so many more renewables because a failure to bring down carbon emissions will result in a planet that is unlivable. Now, you may challenge that last part. You may question the value of the UK bringing down its carbon emissions or the value of net zero in general. Fine, agree to disagree. But even then, do you still think that marginal pricing makes sense for our grid? Because I don't. I think the way our electricity price is calculated hasn't caught up with the technology available. So what do we do? Well, there are four possible options which aren't mutually exclusive. Firstly, we build enough new generation of nuclear or renewables and storage or both to not need to use gas. This is the obvious long-term solution. But as the name implies, it's going to take a while to implement, especially if we decide to build new nuclear. And it's not going to help with electricity prices today. So option number two, we reform the UK electrical grid. Which is a contentious topic. There are some very strong opinions out there in the industry about how this should and shouldn't be done. Maybe different areas of the UK should pay different prices for their electricity. Maybe there should be separate tariffs for renewable and non-renewable generation. I don't know. This is so far out of my area of expertise that it may as well be socialising. The previous government's Review of Electricity Market Arrangements, or REMA, has carried on into the new Labour government and at the moment is considering a baffling but narrowing array of different options for the grid and is likely to make a recommendation next year that the government might act on. Okay, but again, it doesn't help with electricity prices now. So option number three, calling back to something I said earlier, if renewables are the cheapest way to generate electricity, why not generate your own renewable electricity? Of course, this is what many people have done. Over 1.4 million homes in the UK have rooftop solar. Some even have private wind turbines. But these installations are expensive. According to the Energy Saving Trust, the average UK home solar installation costs about £7,000, which they estimate you make back over the course of between 10 and 15 years in electricity savings. And the panels typically last 15 to 20 years after that. So it definitely net saves you money and it insulates you from the price of gas if you have the money to build them in the first place. I, for example, would love to have solar panels on my roof, but um, yeah, YouTube doesn't pay that well. Before I move on to the exciting fourth option, this is probably a good time to mention that I can only make these videos thanks to the support of my patrons. Patrons get early access to videos, they get exclusive content every month, including notably a behind the scenes vlog every month, that's some of my editor's best work, and producer tier patrons and higher get to vote on a video topic a month. If you'd like to join them and help me make more videos, then please head to patreon.com forward slash simonoxviz, link down there in the doobly-doo. And I've got some cocktails here for Jacob, 
Mark Harper and Andrew Barker. Thank you for supporting my work. Anyway, as I was saying, building your own renewable generation prohibitively expensive for most people. But many people live in places where that's just not possible, like rented accommodation or an apartment. Though, and maybe I should make a whole video about this, balcony solar that you can just plug into your wall is becoming increasingly popular and affordable for such people in Europe specifically. But there is another fourth option that partly circumvents marginal pricing, that brings down your electricity bills, and helps roll out new low carbon generation onto the grid, all while being affordable. Energy cooperatives. The idea is simple. Instead of you building new renewable generation, you pool your resources with lots of other people who collectively build a new, larger renewables project. That project could be a solar farm, a wind farm, or even something like geothermal power. Some such projects are purely financial. You invest your money in the cooperative, get a say in how things are run, and get a financial return every year on your initial investment. But some of them instead offer you a share of the electricity that your new project generates. So it's like your initial investment is an upfront payment for future cheap electricity bills from your shared supply. Now, you likely have an awful lot of questions about how exactly that works, and there are hundreds if not thousands of energy cooperatives all around the world that all do things slightly differently. So for the sake of demonstration, I am going to showcase just one called Ripple that works here in the UK that I happened to meet at a recent trade show. So I'm here at Everything Electric in Farnborough, and I'm here with the CEO of Ripple, Sarah Merrick. So Sarah, can you tell me, how does Ripple specifically work? So Ripple enables thousands of people to come together and collectively own large scale wind farms and solar parks, and then get the green low cost electricity that their individual share generates, supplied to them by the grid, by our supply partners, and then they get savings off their electricity bill for the wind farm 30 year life or 40 year life for a solar park. We work with um, Octopus, uh, Co-op Energy, EDF, British Gas, E.ON, Good Energy and Ecotricity. So it's about 70% of the market is covered. So most people would not need to switch supplier to get their savings on their bills. So it's a bit like building your own solar panels. There's an upfront payment and then you eventually make that money back through savings and electricity bills. But unlike building your own solar, the savings follow you around from house to house. If you move, they're not tied to one place. And the upfront payments can be basically as much or as little as you want. In terms of how people can buy shares so we set the minimum is 25 pounds that's not going to get you much of a wind farm or a solar park the maximum is the amount that will generate 120 percent of the electricity that you consume so you can't buy a megawatt of a wind farm unless you need a megawatt of a wind farm to supply your electricity and that's really important from a um, cooperative perspective because it's not it's not a financial investment it's a collective ownership mechanism whereby every, you're, you're joining the co-op in order to get your own source of low-cost electricity coming together with thousands of other people to do something you couldn't do on your own. I want to be extremely clear, this video is not sponsored by Ripple. They've had no editorial control over this video. I just think they're a good example of how you can run an energy cooperative and how even in an electrical grid that hasn't been fully reconfigured for renewables, you can still enjoy the cheaper generation that they afford. And of course, they're a good way to get more low carbon generation onto the grid. In the energy crisis, there are a lot of people, because members were saving such crazy high amounts of money and people were really concerned about energy prices so that was a big driver then as wholesale prices have come down climate has always been a really important driver for members but i think when we speak to lots of members it's clear that you know they want to do something for climate change that's really important but they want it to make sense as well it's like no i've done this amazing thing Oh, and look, I'm saving money off my energy bill as well. At the moment, the UK electrical grid barely works. It's not adapted to the changes that cheap renewables have afforded, increased our electricity bills, and decreased our energy security by exposing us to the price of a commodity that 
we can't control. But it doesn't have to be like that. The UK grid can, and most likely will, be reformed. But we can also change how we interact with it and take some initiative. We always talk about new technological solutions to climate change, renewables for example. But just as important are changes in our social structure, how we organize ourselves. And I think energy cooperatives are a really exciting idea in that category, because not only do they provide a partial solution to a grid that hasn't caught up to how renewables really work, they also build community. The idea of community energy tends to be quite geographically based, whereas actually, you know, we all live in a modern digital connected world. We've got an online community forum where you know, members can chat to each other about the projects. They might be thinking of getting a heat pump or an EV. People can feel as part of that community as they could do, you know, with the person down the road in their village or in their town. On the point of community, whilst we were doing this interview, somebody came up who basically just said to the CEO, oh, I just wanted to say hi, I, I've got several shares in your projects. Um, thank you for everything you're doing. And that wasn't even the only time that I've seen that happen today. But everybody's been coming up to the stall just to say hi and sort of talk to other people. You don't get that with many energy projects. At a time when climate change risks making us all lonelier and more fragmented, a community that brings people together and in the face of adversity provides a solution it doesn't get much better than that. Of course, renewables themselves face a lot of adversity in the media, with a lot of misleading reporting or just lack of reporting. For example, if you mostly get your news stories from sources that lean to the political right, using the American definition, then you are statistically less likely to see news about renewable energy and climate change in general, and those stories will be covered through a different lens. For example, this story about the International Energy Agency saying that tripling global renewables by 2030 is in reach received different coverage from left-leaning and right-leaning sources. The former emphasized the need for global collaboration, while the latter gave more attention to the obstacles to renewables rollout. Or this story about wildlife populations plummeting, about which left-leaning sources highlight the urgent need for action, while right-leaning sources emphasize that some animals have actually been resilient. I wonder why they do that. It's so easy to miss news stories entirely, or only hear about certain aspects of them if you get your news from the same sources every time. Which is why this video's sponsor, Ground News, is so valuable. Ground News is a website and app designed by a former NASA engineer to give you a data-driven perspective on the news you consume, allowing you to spot and circumvent biases and highlighting the factual accuracy of your sources according to three independent news monitoring organizations. I've been personally using Ground News for about a year now, and my favorite aspect is the blind spot feature, which highlights news stories that, based on my previous reading, I probably missed. And that's really valuable for being able to do this job and covering the climate crisis, but it's also really valuable for just learning more about the world and not falling into an echo chamber. Or for that matter, realizing that while you read a diverse range of sources, they're all actually owned by the same media conglomerate, something you can check using Ground News' ownership feature. In an internet that is only becoming more fractured and tribal, I think Ground News is a really valuable tool to improve your media literacy and to keep you informed about what's going on. If you would like to use their tools and of course support this channel, then please head to ground.news slash Simon Clark, where you can get yourself 40% off a Vantage subscription. That link again, ground.news slash Simon Clark, with thanks to Ground News for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please do the YouTube pleasantries, pop it a like, a share, a subscription even. If you'd like to watch something else from me next, then here's two videos I prepared earlier. And that just leaves me to say thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.